Welcome folks. If you're just joining us now, we uh, have said, let us know where you're joining us from and uh, what the weather's like. Uh, you can share that in the chat with everyone. And we're a couple of minutes past the hour here. So I think we are going to get going. I wanna thank everyone for joining us for this webinar where we're gonna be hearing from Waterloo Region about their work in diversion and their first connect program, which offers 24 seven prevention and diversion as a centralized access point for emergency shelter for all single adults across Waterloo Region. We're also gonna be hearing a short update on two Canadian research projects focused on diversion, both of which Waterloo Region is connected to. My name is Marie Morrison. I'm the director of Built for Zero Canada with the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness, and I am your host for today's webinar. Our presenters today include Dr. Stephen Gates, who is the professor uh, in the Faculty of Education at York University in Toronto. Uh, but of course, that's not all. You will also know him as being the president of the Canadian Observatory on Homelessness and the Homeless Hub at York University, as well as co-director of Making the Shift. Uh, the Youth Homelessness Social Innovation Lab and the Toronto Centre for Excellence on Youth Homelessness. And he's going to be sharing just a little bit about the research projects after we hear from our two community presenters, uh, which you're seeing here on the screen now. And a big welcome to Pat Fisher. He's a program analyst in housing policy and homelessness prevention at the region of Waterloo. He has worked in housing services for more than four years, along with 15 years working in public health. Pat is the policy lead for prevention and diversion, family supports and street outreach among other topics. And he is part of a small but mighty team at the region of Waterloo. And then we also have joining us, Laura Coakley. She is the manager of First Connect, exploring housing options and community connections in Waterloo region. She has an MSW from Laurier University and MA from the University of Waterloo. And her background is in community-based research gender violence and community development. And she's been working with First Connect team since July of last year. So a big welcome to both of our presenters. I'm just gonna do uh, some other introductory comments before we jump in and hear from our presenters. We will begin with a land acknowledgement from coast to coast to coast. We acknowledge the ancestral territory of all the Inuit, Métis and First Nations people that call this land home. Uh, I am based in uh, Kitchener, Ontario which is situated on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the neutral peoples whose presence on these lands continue this, to this day. And of course, we encourage you to also share uh, the land from which you're joining us uh, in the chat. This webinar is being brought to you today from the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness, which leads a national movement of individuals, organizations, and communities working together to end homelessness in Canada and includes the six key initiatives that you see listed here. And just a bit of housekeeping before we jump into our topic today. As always, the webinar is being recorded. You will find all uh, recordings and webinars, including this one on the training and technical assistance website under archive webinars. And we'll take a look at that in the moment. You might notice that closed captioning is enabled. You can choose to view that or not. Everyone is muted. And we really encourage you to ask questions either through the chat or the question function. And uh, really just encourage you to use the chat throughout if you're wanting to make a reflection on what you're hearing or share something that's going on in your community. And just as I mentioned, all the webinars can be found on the training and technical assistance website under webinars, you'll see upcoming webinars. And while we have finished the series of twice monthly webinars that were sponsored by Reaching Home, uh, any more ad hoc webinars that we continue to do, you will find here as well as all of the past archived webinars. And just wanted to highlight, we did recently have a webinar. We were kind of pairing these two topics together. So uh, Org Code presented their Diversion and Housing Loss Prevention Guide in May. And so when you get the PDF of this file afterwards, you'll be able to link into that recording, the PDF and the guide. And then we get to hear about diversion in practice today. And I just want you to know that you can find a whole host of diversion resources on our website under resources. So under resources, under program areas, it will take you to this program areas page. You'll see the first box is actually diversion. If you click on there, 
you will find a drop down menu of all sorts of resources and information. And we'll be adding the last two webinars uh, on diversion into the diversion webinars drop down as well. And with no uh, further ado, I will now turn it over to Laura to share the first Connect program with us. Awesome, that sounds great. Thank you so much. Um, so like uh, Marie said, my name is Laura Coakley and I'm the manager of the First Connect team in Waterloo Region. I'm honored to be here today to share a bit about Argus's history and our journey towards um, prevention and diversion services in Waterloo Region. So if you could change the first slide, please. So Argus Residents for Young People is a charitable organization which was established in 1986 when they began providing emergency shelter to young people between 16 to 24 years old in Cambridge, Ontario. At this time, they were by bed the largest youth specific emergency shelter in the region. Um, also, if I'm going through and nobody can hear me, just please um, let me know and I can try to lean in a little bit further. You sound great, Laura, you're good. Oh, great, awesome, thanks. <laughs> so Argus continued to offer emergency shelter for many years until they were approached by the region of Waterloo to pilot a prevention and diversion program for Cambridge youth. This launched in 2015 from one of the emergency shelter locations in Cambridge. Over an 11 month period, Argus homeless prevention and, and shelter diversion workers managed to divert 40 youth from accessing emergency shelter, 21 of whom returned home safely. So thanks to those results, in the summer of 2016, the Argus team began putting together a prevention and diversion tool that our workers could use to begin conversations around alternative supports for individuals with housing instability or for those um, and or for those uh, experiencing homelessness. This tool was used as an intake process when working with youth who were entering um, our youth shelter at the time. Between 2016 and 2017, the number of youth staying in our shelter beds decreased by 67%. This showed us and the region that a prevention and diversion model was useful and was successful when diverting youth from accessing shelters. In 2018, we were able to expand this program to serve adults across Waterloo Region. At this time, there was a lot of stress on our shelter system as one of our emergency shelters had just recently closed. And of course, we know that there's been even more stress added to our shelter systems with the compounding um, factors of uh, COVID-19, uh, seasonality, influxes, and so on. So through the work of our prevention and diversion team, Argus was able to close its emergency shelters for youth in August 2019. These locations were transitioned into care homes for youth to provide trauma-informed long-term housing using a care practice model. Uh, if you could change the slide, please, Marie. Thank you. So before we began this work, individuals would go directly to shelters to access their services. There was no centralized approach, so shelters would have to coordinate access into the shelter system while also dealing with capacity challenges, seasonality influxes, and navigating housing needs, among various other um, challenges that they, that they were going through. When prevention and diversion expanded to include all individuals in Waterloo Region who were 18 and over, which was in 2019, um, we first needed to overcome several misconceptions within our shelter system and ourselves. These included the idea that prevention and diversion was yet another step in the process of accessing emergency shelter. Also that it was too bureaucratic and that people would have to prove their eligibility in order to access shelter. What we needed to show our shelter partners as well as the region was that we were providing a service that we were able to offer those who are about to become homeless and those who are already experiencing homelessness. So we came to this work by trying to put aside these assumptions so that we can meet people where they're at, slow down the conversation to explore what we can do to support them in preventing or diverting them from needing to access shelter. And then as well to provide them with appropriate resources and referrals to community um, organizations. If you could go to the next slide, please. So 
how does this work? And actually, I did just um, speak about this as well. If you could go to the next slide, thanks. So just utilizing prevention and diversion as a service and not as a barrier to receiving um, supports, which it, which there is a, still a, a bit of an assumption around that. But I think that we have been doing a good job of showing our community that this is a needed service um, to support the individuals that would access shelter as well as the shelter system. So um, just a little bit about how our line works. So we've recently changed our name to First Connect, uh, exploring housing options and community connections. And we changed our name to better represent all of the supports that we provide and as, as well to highlight uh, the centralized approach to accessing our shelter system. Our focus is on prevention, which we define in accordance to Ian DeYoung's definition um, that he provided a few weeks ago at the last um, presentation or web webinar presentation. So he defines prevention as the work that occurs before someone loses their housing and diversion as um, the work that takes place once an individual has lost housing, but prior to shelter entry. So that, that point after they've lost housing, but just prior to the shelter entry. So our work here is to divert someone to a safe alternative option to emergency shelter. At present, um, our work starts with a call to our Central First Connect phone line, which is available 24 seven for all single adults and youth 18 and over in Waterloo region. People call into the service by phone and if folks don't have access to a phone, they often make their way to an emergency shelter, a resource center, drop-in center, um, or other community organization to connect with us. Through exploratory questions, we aim to better understand the experiences of an individual, how they got to this point, what has worked for them in the past, and go over safe and appropriate alternatives to shelter. This work involves increasing attachment to family and loved ones, if it's safe to do so, connecting individuals with community resources and supports when appropriate, and also some education around the importance of housing first and the housing first model and exploring these options. We know that each person's situation is unique and we want to pull in as many supports and resources within our community as we can so that the individual feels empowered to choose what's the best option for them. So as you can see here, um, through this diagram, uh, somebody contacts us first, we go through those exploratory questions with them to see if there are other options for them. And then we have a few outcomes. Um, some of the time we are able to, or uh, one of the outcomes is um, connecting or reconnecting somebody with a family member, a loved one or friend who is able to provide um, house, safe housing for that individual. And sometimes getting to that space as needed. So we are able to utilize flex funding to help make an option more viable. So we can provide travel fare. Um, if there is someone that, uh, or a household that can uh, accommodate someone that gives us a call um, and we can help them get there, air uh, flights, um, trains, buses, whatever it may be. Uh, we can also cover the cost of groceries or bedding if a friend or neighbor is able to house someone and needs a bit more support. So we have also in our flex funding, um, we're able to um, think outside of the box and come up with other solutions of, um, of supports that we can provide in order for them to stay in safe housing. We also make phone calls or offer support with mediation and connect people with counseling services when there's been a relationship breakdown. So resolving conflict is also something that we do a lot on the line, um, advocating for individuals, speaking to family members, loved ones or friends, as well as um, doing some preliminary uh, mediation support with landlords. Um, and then, of course, if uh, emergency shelter is the best option for the individual at the time of call, we help them with getting into that, um, into an emergency shelter. So making sure that there's space available for them, that the shelter is aware um, of them coming, and then um, helping them, making sure that they get there safely. If you could change the slides, please. Thank you. 
Uh, so we follow the ABCs of our shelter policies, uh, our, our shelters policy in uh, Waterloo Region. So this begins with avoiding shelter when possible. We will always explore homelessness prevention and shelter diversion to other safe and appropriate options before discussing emergency shelter access. So that is um, part of our initial, um, the initial few um, minutes of a conversation on our line is going over um, what the line is for and um, discussing what other options might be viable before going into uh, what the shelter stay could look like. So this also includes um, engaging with other systems such as families, uh, family and children's services, family counseling, housing resource center, uh, the mental health crisis respite, treatment facilities for substance use, Canadian Mental Health Association, um, landlord mediation, legal services, um, and many others as well. The B stands for bringing together all housing and homelessness sector services within the region. And this includes being housing focused, um, being accessible, safe, and being strength based, as well as balancing shelter demand with limited shelter resources. So in this, um, in this section, we aim to reinforce the purpose of shelter as um, the last option for emergency purposes for individuals and not as, as an alternative to housing they already have or somewhere to send children for um, behavioral management or something like that. Um, we try to keep that uh, prevention and diversion messaging when we're working with our community partners as well. And lastly, the C stands for community resolving complex housing issues through collaboration within the um, housing stability system. So this really just means that we uh, work together to address gaps and barriers for the individuals that we work with and support. And um, whenever there are challenges that we are all um, in the loop about those challenges and all working together um, to support the individuals that we serve. If you go to the next slide, thank you. So um, just some of our most recent statistics. So in 2021, we received over 5,300 calls to our phone line, so to First Connect. Uh, this includes not only calls for emergency shelter or housing resources, but it also, also includes calls to connect individuals to treatment centers, mental health services, and crisis services. We were able to prevent um, someone's experience of homelessness or divert them from accessing shelter in 45% of our calls. Since January of this year, we've received 2,700 calls to our line and successfully prevented and diverted 60% of those calls. Go to the next one. Thank you. One thing that we've been finding a lot um, and that we've been working um, in collaboration with the region and other local community organizations is, um, a, is working on uh, collecting more data to better understand um, the complexities that exist within our shelter system. So we've begun to, begun to focus a lot on data um, to understand these trends, as well as to address any gaps or root causes of homelessness within our region. So for example, we recently did a pilot research study um, that took place between January and March of this year. Um, and we did it in um, collaboration with our local housing resource center to understand the reasons why people are accessing our shelter system. We had 177 callers participate in this short study. Um, and from our analysis, we found that 38% of women accessed shelter due to a relationship breakdown. So this could be um, outstaying their welcome, not getting along with someone, um, a breakup, arguments, those types of things. Um, but more men than women experienced a relationship breakdown due to substance use and or addictions. Most people that lost their housing and needed to access shelter did so from a room for rent. 24% of participants access shelter after having been um, discharged from an institution, and this was primarily a local hospital or correctional facility in Ontario. 
50% of those that were discharged from a hospital were not homeless prior to admittance, but 65% of those that were discharged from a correctional facility were not homeless prior to going to that correctional facility. So um, this is just a little summary of some of the data that we've collected, but um, it really does help us to better understand the inflow of people into our shelter system so that we can start to create um, and come up with ideas of preventative programs to support our community. Um, and those are just some upstream initiatives that we've been working on um, within the community and the region specifically has been working on um, and doing some amazing work with addressing these, these uh, root causes. Go to the next slide, please. Sorry, um, I just have one other piece um, was uh, that we um, that our next steps are to do more diversion work in shelters. So in the fall, our team identified a gap in services between when someone contacted our phone line access shelter and then waited to figure out next steps with a housing advisor, for example. Um, and that would be either a housing advisor at the shelter or at a local at our local housing resource center. So we found that a lot of information came out in conversations with shelter staff the day after and an individual arrived to shelter, had a time, had some space to rest and were able to talk in person with someone about their situation and what their next steps are. So um, we are, we just began in May um, to start doing in-person follow-up conversations to uh, meet with people in person at shelter uh, to understand their situation and to see if we can support them with coming up with short-term and long-term goals on um, how they can exit shelter the quickest way possible. We're also hoping to do more prevention work in the community over the coming months to address some of the reasons that I had outlined um, of why people access shelter in, a reason, uh, in our region and these conversations have already begun, which is really exciting. Um, so that's everything for me. Thank you again for having me today. I'll pass it along to Pat. Thanks, Laura. Um, I, I wanted to uh, start off um, just uh, recognizing uh, and appreciating uh, Angela Pye, who's on the line here, who was, uh, she along with Marie were foundational in setting up our prevention and diversion um, program at the start. Um, and the past several years, we have uh, shifted and evolved and learned as we've, as we've gone through. Um, but that uh, foundational pieces um, are still there and really kind of guide, really, really guide this work. So I'm going to share with you some of the uh, insights that we've learned from an indicator's perspective. Um, our community uses HIFAS and um, we have a community and so also all of the uh, service providers uh, use HIFAS and we have some information sharing uh, between each other. And so it allows us to do some kind of comparison work, um, but it also requires us to have some custom reports done and um, those who've worked with HIFAS know that that's uh, time consuming and challenges. So some of this uh, indicators I'm gonna talk about today are kind of new for us. Um, but the results that we're seeing are really exciting. And, and though I want to share with you some of our thinking um, so that you can think about how you might want to track data uh, to help describe this program. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to focus today on uh, diversion, but um, we often talk prevention and diversion in the same kind of, it's almost one word. And, and so just wanted to say a little bit about our, our prevention work. Um, uh, it's led by uh, Lutherwood Housing Services. Um, they run a housing resource center for um, further upstream folks who are at risk or, or um, concerned about losing their housing. And that's really the prevention work. And what we've learned from looking at the data there, um, there are lots of reasons that people become um, homeless, but the number one driver is arrears. So uh, we have spent uh, considerable time trying to find as many options as possible and it's often as many as possible because uh, it's not a single solution to um, get early notification and to make sure landlords are paid. Um, when we have households lose their uh, their units right now, um, 
it's super hard in this in this economic time and this um, this rental market to actually get one. So the more that we do and the more that we can do around um, ensuring that arrears are small and that they don't happen at all, um, that's the the most uh, cost effective, the most uh, time uh, effective work that you can do around prevention. Next slide, please. So we're excited to have evolved, as, as Laura talked about, um, from diversion as a, um, a service where we were encouraging people to call um, and to work through the process before entering into emergency shelter. And through COVID, um, we've really helped to shift this to largely coordinated entry. And um, uh, COVID has caused, uh, caused lots of issues, but it's also created some opportunities. And one is the ability for us to work closer together and to make the uh, phone line in our community, our, our diversion efforts are largely through the phone line, be a source of connecting and coordination between providers. So we have uh, a single phone line for single adults 18 and plus across the region. Um, that line will also refer you to the youth line. So Safe Haven is one of our uh, youth emergency shelters and they'll do the uh, diversion work for those 12 to 18 um, and refer between themselves and another youth shelter. And then we have a family specific stream um, and they have phone lines during business hours as well as after hours uh, calls with one of our emergency shelters. So we have three different um, providers uh, and one phone number that you can connect and they'll refer back and forth. And really, we are by and large, uh, except for some of the uh, temporary winter overflow shelters, um, using a coordinated entry through our, our diversion services. Next slide, please. There are four key indicators I would um, suggest that you look at counting and tracking as, uh, as key for this work. Next slide. So the volume of calls, a um, couple things that, that happens there is that it helps to identify appropriate levels of resourcing. How many staff um, do you actually need online? How long is the wait time for people to actually get through? Um, are there changes in the number of calls uh, month over month. So are we seeing shifts earlier on in our system and pressures that allows us to adapt to our programming and to try to uh, problem solve as quickly as possible. There's benefits to those who are at risk of, of homelessness um, by having the uh, all the calls go through one number. So um, there's a consistency, there's an awareness of, of what's available. There's, we funnel all of the changes to our system um, and things shift and change all the time. Um, through this line, so there's a consistent messaging and consistent understanding of where spaces are. Uh, in COVID, we had some emergency shelters that were closed at different times um, because of outbreaks. And so we could really quickly and easily adapt to those, uh, to those changes by having a centralized approach. A second is there's a benefit to community partners. So we have now have the phone line available 24 seven, and it's a real uh, benefit to EMS, to police, to fire who are in contact with people in evenings and weekends and often difficult times that they know where to, to direct people for support and how to get people the help that they need. Um, it's a real benefit to emergency shelter partners because again, there's a consistent approach there and as Laura mentioned, uh, we are seeing significant numbers of folks who are diverted to other safe and appropriate housing. You might have noticed the uh, first year, the, the numbers are about 45% and the second year, 60%. Part of that, actually, I'll talk a bit more as we go on, is about better data. Um, the first number was really the way we were tracking was at the end of a, at the uh, conversation with the, prevention, with the diversion team would be a determination if someone had been referred to a shelter. We're now able to follow that through and see if actually people went to emergency shelter. And that's where we've gone from like a 45% to a 60% because about 20% of people who at the end of the call, you think you've referred them to a shelter actually don't go there, but they've gotten what they needed and, and are able to find other solutions. And then as a service system manager, one of the benefits of having a, a, a centralized call center is that we get early notification of issues. And so trends that are coming up, concerns coming up, you know, we're starting to get a lot of calls from seniors. You know, there's, we're, 
I'm getting people showing up from corrections, and I don't remember getting a notification about that. It allows us to early uh, respond and react and try to, uh, to address the issues as they come up. Um, so it's a really helpful early, early warning system for ourselves. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we also track is referral from. So uh, it really, and Laura helped to talk about uh, a two month uh, tracking that they did and uh, really detailed reporting in terms of understanding where people are coming from, to help us look at what areas we need to establish. And so, you know, for example, a significant number of folks in, in that case were coming out of corrections and we have the early stages of a, of a working group with, with several different uh, corrections um, partners around community reintegration. And it identified uh, amongst the, the partners that it's a conversation that used to happen that fell off the, off the side of the desk. And it's one that everybody is interested in. So just having that early identification, having that understanding of where people are coming from can lead to further benefits of the prevention and diversion efforts. Um, next slide. One of the things that intuitively people want to say with prevention and diversion work is successful versus unsuccessful. And we've really kind of refined that language to be referral from and referral to, because um, in many cases, in some cases, their referral to emergency shelter is the most appropriate outcome. And so it's really important to use um, uh, clear and directed language to make sure that you're representing the service and, and what the outcomes of that service are, and not really putting that kind of successful, unsuccessful um, labeling on that. Uh, one of the things that we have seen is that 10% um, of calls that we get are for information only. So people calling on behalf of a, of a child and behalf of a friend, um, perhaps behalf of themselves, just wanting to understand what the options are. Where, what, how does this work? What would happen if I did that? And so um, it's helpful to know that when you can track it with in terms of the referrals and what kind of information is being asked for. And again, as I mentioned earlier, about 25% of people who are referred to shelter uh, never show up and never go to shelter and really kind of amplifies the value of the diversion conversation. Um, and that uh, sometimes it takes time for it to percolate through uh, and people need a little bit of time to process and explore their options um, before having to go to shelter. Next slide. That leads to the amplification of the diversion service um, and the blending into rapid resolution. So one of the things that we're doing in terms of tracking is we're starting to track um, people who go to emergency shelter for two days or less in the two weeks following a call. And uh, a couple of reasons that we're doing that, one is that we, we know as the transportation systems, the bus systems have, have shrunk, it often takes a bit of time to set up a uh, um, transportation or travel back to a home community. It also takes time to make sure that supports are ready to meet people on the other end. And so sometimes people are going to emergency shelter just as a stopgap until we can arrange those supports and reconnections. We want to really want to uh, capture that. Um, as we're starting to look at that report and, and it's, it's, it's kind of an in-progress report, um, I would say that the numbers of people who are staying within two days or less is significantly higher than we would have thought. So it's really by tracking and kind of understanding that the diversion um, uh, service is not a, a single point, but more of a fluid um, spread really helps to uh, see the value of it and, um, and the benefit to people and to service providers. What we are starting to do, um, we have a, a prioritized access to housing supports. Our PADS teams works with folks who are uh, prioritized with chronicity and uh, acuity level, at risk level. And they've identified that we're continuing to see people age into housing. So as much as we are housing people, you know, and, and um, uh, built for zero, you know, originally was 20,000 homes and we realized it's not a number, it's a process that needs to happen. And so we're looking at, um, although we housed 500 people in our community from homelessness last year, our numbers of chronically homeless are increasing. So we're looking at how do we 
take advantage of the diversion conversations, extend it to the first couple of weeks that someone is at emergency shelter and hand it off to those who are also working on um, rapid resolution. So it's, it's part of that whole continuum. Um, and again, rather than a single point, it's an ongoing service. Next slide. A few things that we're still wondering, um, we've been doing this for about four years uh, at a, as a community as a whole way. And you know the, the buy-in, um, utility, the uh, number of hours, the effectiveness has all grown, but we're still trying to wonder about things like how long between an emergency shelter stage should we use before someone goes back through diversion again? Um, you know, how do we support people who bounce in and out of shelter, who are in for three or four days, gone for two or three weeks, back in again? How can we take advantage of those connections that people have to help sustain those and become more permanent? Because um, the data is showing us and, and trying to figure out how do we stretch and build on the foundations of what we have in the diversion work. The other thing that we're looking at um, is how do you recognize and take advantage of the readiness. Um, so we had uh, a couple of our emergency shelters that were temporary overflow shelters for the winter and had service fairs looking at, people are gonna be really motivated to look at other options as that shelter grow, uh, closes. How do we take advantage of that so they can relook at maybe family connections, maybe relook at some kind of informal connections and strengthen those so that we can lead to more housing outcomes. So again, we've moved from like a one phone call to uh, including that French and diversion work in the next few, uh, few days at emergency shelter, and also looking at key times in the life cycle of people at emergency shelters to try to um, find housing in as many creative ways as we possibly can. Next slide. So that's from the Waterloo Region perspective, and I will pass it along to Marie and Stephen for the next section. Wonderful, thanks so much, uh, both Laura and Pat. That was fascinating and I'm, yeah, just so excited about the work that you're doing. And uh, I'm sure, I, I know I have some questions and comments I wanted to make and I'm thinking others uh, on the line do as well. I can only imagine we're ending at two o'clock today. We're gonna be a little short on time for questions. So I really encourage you to put those questions ideally even into the chat. And then if uh, we don't get to them, if you can also leave your email, we'll make sure that we follow up uh, and try to capture some of those and include them uh, later on after the presentation goes out so that uh, we can answer those. But uh, I do want to now uh, turn it over to Stephen to walk us through a couple of research projects. And Stephen, uh, I have the slides here. I can just move through them for you. Um, and I'm noticing you're, you you look like you're in a very lovely outdoor setting. <laughs> yes, it'd be great if you moved the slides. It, this is the first time I've ever uh, done a webinar in a park. <laughs> so I'm in Toronto and was between meetings and got in the worst traffic jam I've ever. Someone offered me a lift to where I needed to go. So anyway, I kind of bailed, not while the car was moving, but... Uh, I'm sitting in a park now, so it's quite lovely. All right. Well, we'll turn it over to you and uh, just let me know when you want me to advance the slides. Great. Okay. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, our um, activities around research on shelter diversion. So next slide. Um, there, you know, the focus on shelter diversion and its increasing popularity is part of a broader shift I think we're seeing uh, in how we think about responding to homelessness, which is to consider the role of prevention. Um, I think the pandemic's been informative to us all that, uh, like, can you imagine dealing with COVID-19 without prevention? Like no masks, no staying at home lockdowns, no, uh, you know, personal protection devices, no, no uh, vaccines, instead, let's just wait until everyone gets really sick and then help them and so no one would mostly no one would like to go down that road but we need to really think about prevention more so next slide and there's also an interesting imperative here uh the government of canada through reaching home has four mandatory outcome areas right so and i think people will probably be familiar with these i want to focus on the bottom two 
uh, new inflows into homelessness are reduced and returns to homelessness are reduced. The next slide there. Or so all of those latter two are about prevention, right? How do we reduce the numbers? And Pat, you made a comment about growing numbers of chronic, chronically homeless people. If we don't focus more effort on prevention, like every chronically homeless person was homeless for the first time once. And um, if we do a better job of helping people at the at the beginning there, we're gonna have better outcomes for for those individuals, for their families, and for the communities involved. The challenge is, what do we do about it and how do we get there? Next. So the shelter diversion is an obvious way and one that can be applied within the current context of emergency services and supports. And it requires a real rethink about what the task is, because shelters are basically designed for the purposes of intake. You know, people show up, we get your information, we bring you in. Shelter diversion flips that on its head and says, the goal is actually to help you not become a resident and certainly a long-term one. Next. So I'm gonna, here's a definition of it, um, but I'm gonna talk about two major pr projects that we're involved in. And here are some of the key questions that come from it. We need more research. It's, Pat, you, 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 what was interesting with your presentation is it shows that you're doing research real time. We need more research on something like shelter diversion to really hone our service delivery models and ensure we're getting the outcomes we want. Um, you know, questions like, are we actually preventing someone's homelessness or merely postponing it? Um, what kind of evidence base for what works we need to, the people are doing really good work but we need to pull that up from the ground for whom does it work for whom does it not work as well are there needs of different subpopulations and what do communities need to know to implement shelter diversion i think this can happen in every community and um, and so this is the direction we need to go into okay next so two projects, one is through the Canadian Observatory on Homelessness and the other is focusing on youth homelessness through Making the Shift Youth Homelessness Social Innovation Lab. Next. So the first one here is a project called Building Local Capacity to Reduce Homelessness Through Shelter Diversion and Evictions Prevention. There's overlap between those two, of course, but they do offer different opportunities and projects. So I'm going to focus on um, the shelter diversion side of things here. Next. So what we're doing, uh, the objectives and activities of this are to engage communities uh, in, the, in this project, not us sit in a corner and, and work on what do we think shelter diversion is, but to really draw on the knowledge, uh, including from the people who are presenting on this call. We, are, we have an Indigenous advisory circus, circle to really help us develop out uh, how to do this well with Indigenous people. We're going to select uh, three partner leading organizations to be part of this experiment and this development of knowledge. Uh, so the second part then, sector engagement, we need to find out who's interested or who's doing shelter diversion right now and who wants to do shelter diversion. And then following that, who is ready to go down that road? Because then we can plan and coordinate uh, training and technical assistance. Next. Um, so this is just a, a, an overview of who's involved in the project. We, are, we will share this uh, with whoever is interested. It's just a matter of seeing, you know, so, um, so we, Pat, you're on the list. You've signed up. Uh, next. So continuing this, we need to work on research service des model design and evaluation. So that's one of the things the observatory works on is we try to create program models, program model guides by drawing on different examples and finding what are the common elements, what are the most successful elements, what are the key things that need you need to know if you and your community wants to set this up. Um, we're, uh, you know, the, so we'll do this service model design and then next we'll develop out resources, the program model guides, the fact sheets, that kind of thing. And then the final part is mobilizing the knowledge. So how do we support the sector? How do we support community entities to implement these things? What capacity building needs to happen? So we'll be doing a training and technical assistance uh, and 
support that with the development of a community of practice so you can in real time learn from each other as you go forward. That's the best way to learn anything uh, is to, to be able to talk through with other people. We're stuck on this thing. Do you have any help? So next. So this is the second project. This is with the uh, uh, Making the Shift Youth Homelessness Social Innovation Lab. And it's a, a multi-year project that we've funded uh, with Katrina Mullaney at U of C. Uh, yay U of C. I don't hear anybody cheering, but anyway, that's where I went. Uh, and so uh, I'll give you some overview of what this project involves. Next. So it involves a comparative study involving five different programs in five locations. It's focusing on youth homelessness. The causes and conditions of youth homelessness are unique and distinct from adults. So the service model design has to reflect that. Most young people leave home not because they're evicted or things like that. It's because of a family conflict and breakdown in, in family relations. So that whole focusing on building family and natural supports as part of shelter diversion is going to be a key thing. Uh, next. So uh, Katrina is going to do an ethnographic study, so a deep dive on each of these program models. She's also going to draw data from a thousand youth uh, looking at HMIS and HIFAS and intake data and do interviews with over 400 youth and family members to understand and track their history, right? So when did you first show up at a shelter? What happened after? What was the intervention? How did it work? What was successful? What wasn't? So that longitudinal approach will really get at the question, are we really having an impact uh, and preventing someone's homelessness or simply diverting it. We'll be looking at document, we're doing document reviews and we have a panel of uh, young people with lived experience of youth homelessness that are going to contribute. So it's a very detailed study that will track people who are in shelter diversion programs over the next three years, touching base with them to see how things are going so that we can learn more about what's effective. Next. So, um, here are some of the research questions. I won't read them out because I find it boring when uh, someone reads their slides. But anyway, we really want to get at basically, how does this work? How does it work for youth and how is it different than for adults? What are the successful approaches? What are the key ingredients? I mentioned enhancing family and natural supports. Is, uh, you know, uh, attachment to education going to be key diversion tactic? Uh, what kind of asset building pieces that are we would apply to young people anyway can be part of the, the work here? What are the longitudinal outcomes for people who are diverted? What happens to them? Not just did they uh, um, no longer become homeless, but are they connecting back to school? Are they staying in place? These kinds of things. And we want to really integrate the perspectives of young people and their families. Next. The uh, potential impact, we're going to generate real world strategies and organizational policies and practices that are designed specifically to help you in the community, uh, service providers, people working for community entities to implement this knowledge in, in a very comprehensive way. We're working to de develop uh, potential for common data measures for prevention. Um, so that'll be an important piece of work. I know there's lots of different assessment tools out there. I've had a look at a lot of them, uh, you know, so the question of like, how do we, how do we do that? What, how, what information do we need? Um, how do we get from the presenting issue of a person who shows up at the shelter to the underlying issues that need to be addressed? We'll, uh, develop an evidence-based service model. Uh, and toolkits and other resources that are going to help communities. And that'll be accompanied again by training and technical assistance that we can offer up and plugging people in again to a uh, community of practice. So again, so you will learn from each other. Next. So that's it. And there's now over to Marie. There's a, a time for a few co questions, I guess, or Yes, thank you so much, Stephen. That was a wonderful overview. Um, and I'm seeing we have a couple of questions and there's some dialogue happening in the chat related to HIFAS. 
And I see that Adam Anderson is on the line and I thank Angela for answering some questions. I just uh, allowed you to talk, Adam. I don't know if you wanna share, I mean, I don't wanna like out it, but there is a diversion module coming in HIFAS and I wondered if you wanted to say more about that. <laughs> and hopefully you're still at your desk. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Sure, so, so yeah, we're working on a diversion module in HIFAS, which, aligns a lot with the last webinar, I guess, led by Ian DeYoung. So our recommendations have come both from uh, CEH, the broader group from Acre Consulting, and then through our, our HIFAS National Working Group. But uh, for the next major release in HIFAS, a diversion module is, uh, is, is expected to be one of the, the key deliverables in uh, the next major release in HIFAS. That's amazing. Yeah, folks are super excited about that. Yeah, I think right now people could probably record information in about three different locations and there's pros and cons to each of those. And so this will hopefully uh, just create a more logical flow in place for people to uh, record uh, the data. And as you were both just saying, like the data is so important. And Pat, I just love how you folks are using your data, how you're doing some of that rapid kind of testing and responding. And it's really exciting. Yeah, we have some great partners. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we'll continue to take, we've got about five more minutes and we'll keep taking questions uh, from the chat or the question function. In a moment, I'll launch a little poll just to say, hey, how did you hear about this webinar and uh, get a bit of information and feedback from you. Um, if I'm not seeing questions coming through, uh, panelists may have questions of each other. I know I have a couple of questions, so uh, maybe I'll just pause there and see if there's any questions between the panelists. The only thing I would I would say, Stephen, you were asking about you know what's different around youth, and and one of the things that we learned um, through earlier on was, uh, and it's led to some of the the follow up work that Laura talked about in terms of in shelter, because we do largely over the phone um, pre entry. It's a different process, and and we had some diversion happening at shelter, and found um, with youth they would kind of say anything to get in. Like I'm in stress, I'm in, I need a place. And so whatever I need would need to say to get into the shelter, because that's what I needed right now, they would do. And the staff who were doing the diversion work would then find after a day or two, oh, you do have somebody here, there is something there. And then, you know, it would take a bit of that uh, warming process and connecting process. And then options were uh, presented and evolved and they could follow up. Um, but it didn't always happen at the front door uh, because of being in crisis and trying to just kind of meet their goal of getting a place to say that. I, I think that's an absolutely excellent point and so true. The relational piece is, is really key. And as I say, it's the difference between the presenting issue and underlying. We found in, uh, in some of our preliminary research, for instance, that young people will say they have no family members that they could connect with. And after a while you find out like, what about your grandmother? And it turns out the young person's embarrassed and didn't want the grandmother to know what's going on. And so the work, the worker then is, well, you know what? I think your grandmother would, could possibly prefer you to come and stay there that had know that you're staying where you are. And so like all of those things take time because people aren't going to open up right away. So um, it means that you have to think about like, uh, and not get too hung up on, you know, like it's got to be like instant resolution because you can't get to the res resolution without the relational re relationship building. So excellent point. Which I think speaks, Pat, to some of the work you folks have been thinking about, like how do we continue just having that culture of diversion that continues into different services and you keep asking at continual points about that. It's really exciting. Uh, what you're doing. It, and the other thing that we've done, and I didn't really talk about it too much there, is in our reporting, we asked for some, um, a couple times a year, some qualitative narratives to kind of illustrate the complexity of the work. And, you know, um, the, the stories and the connections and how much of a service instead of a screen it is becomes really clear. I don't know, Laura, if you have any, uh, a couple of examples that come off the top of your head that you might be able to share in terms of talking about the multiple steps that needed to happen in order to help uh, someone get the support that they need. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the few things that come to mind um, are like when we're able to slow down the conversation and really understand what's going on for someone who is at times in crisis, especially because we're a 24 um, seven phone line. So people calling at 11 p.m. or 2 a.m. Um, are more in crisis. But um, we've had some times where people have just been locked out of their houses. So we were able to connect them to a locksmith and get them into their housing. And um, if there were larger issues around um, paying rent or the landlord is um, is not awake at night or something like that, um, those are conversations that we can help them with the next day. So um, yeah, things, things like that that come up, but also just not stopping uh, the conversation at, do you have friends or family? It's, um, do you have... Uh, do you have extended family? Uh, do you have uh, grandparents or anybody that's inside or outside of the water of the region? So really, like I said, like just slowing down the conversation so then we can unpack more of their situation um, and learn more about their experience. And we're finding that doing that type of work in person um, the next day or next few days after they've um, accessed shelter has also been really beneficial to outline those um, short-term and long-term goals that they have for exiting shelter as well. Great. Uh, you know, I have a, a one, we were doing the early diversion work and like a story that just has always stuck with me as a mom who was moving into, she finally got into affordable social housing. Uh, she, you know, the timing ended up not lining up and she'd given up her apartment before the other one was available for her. So for her and her baby, they were heading to shelter December 1st and planning to stay there for two months until their housing became available. And it ended up being a simple phone call to say, hey, could we figure out something out and get earlier into this apartment or into this social housing unit? It was possible. You just think people end up going to the shelter for the most unnecessary reasons when there's other options. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, we have a question here for you. Has there been any research conducted or planned on the success of shelter diversion programs in relation to housing markets in different cities? So yeah, how much is the housing market affecting the success of diversion strategies? Oh, you're on mute. I was just typing out an answer to that, but I, I guess I'll just speak to it. The uh, no, there aren't any studies yet on that question. In fact, there's very little published research on uh, shelter diversion, period. Um, but the study that I mentioned with Katrina Mullaney involves five cities um, currently with the potential of adding Toronto. So you'll have big cities like Calgary and Toronto, but you'll also have uh, Guelph and Cambridge and uh, um, uh, St. Catharines. So different cities, different housing markets will be able to look at in doing that comparative work, uh, you know, contextual differences between places. And that will be very helpful. Like what are the barriers to doing uh, shelter diversion based on different cities? Um, and so that will be important. It's coming. <laughs> it's exciting it's exciting to get an update on all of the great work that's happening and again thank you all of you for your time thank you Stephen for like parking in a park and joining <laughs> us and Laura and Pat for uh you know the presentation you've put together and all that you've shared and uh, again this is recorded it will be posted we'll be sending stuff out in a couple of days to folks and we hope you have a great uh rest of your Thursday and a great uh heading into the weekend thanks all again right. everyone thanks everyone Thanks, Marie. Thank you. Bye, all. Bye.